Again, it's Matthew 14, verses 22 to 33. We're going to have an alternate reading, which means I'll read the first verse. We'll respond all together with the verse after that. We'll keep going back and forth until the end. So again, it's Matthew 14, 22 to 33. Immediately, Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go on ahead of him to the other side while he dismissed the crowd. After he had dismissed them, he went up on a mountainside by himself to pray. Later that night, he was there alone. And the boat was already a considerable distance from land, buffeted by the waves because the wind was against it. Shortly before dawn, Jesus went out to them, walking on the lake. When the disciples saw him walking on the lake, they were terrified. It's a ghost, they said, and cried out in fear. But Jesus immediately said to them, Take courage, it is I. Don't be afraid. Lord, if it's you, Peter replied, tell me to come to you on the water. Come, he said. Then Peter got down out of the boat, walked on the water, and came toward Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid, and beginning to sink, cried out, Lord, save me. Immediately, Jesus reached out his hand and caught him. You of little faith, he said, why did you doubt? And when they climbed into the boat, the wind died down. Then those who were in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God, the Word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. You may be seated. Well, in uh, LGM, we've been uh, going through a sermon series called Discipleship Now, where we've been talking about how do you actually become a disciple that looks like Jesus, that resembles him in character and life? And that is the great question that we have been trying to answer together. And as we've been going through this journey, one of the things that you will encounter, I guarantee, if you attempt to be like Jesus, you will run smack dab into a great problem. And that problem is failure. How many of you, I wonder, like failing? Does anyone like failing? Probably no one. <laughs> it's a pretty universal thing that we don't like to fail. I hate failure. I remember watching a, uh, a movie, a, a Disney movie, a few years back called Meet the Robinsons. Has anyone seen this movie? Um, it's about an orphan uh, named... Um, Oh, I forget his name right now. It escapes me. Uh, but, uh, uh, oh, his name is Lewis. Uh, so uh, Lewis is this kid who is an inventor. And uh, he is not able to get adopted. Nobody seems to want him. And he keeps getting rejected over and over again. And his inventions don't tend to work. And so he gets very frustrated. Um, but one day he meets this very eccentric family called the Robinsons, hence the title of the movie, Meet the Robinsons. And um, they ask him to fix an invention. And he fails spectacularly. It's like this invention where you're supposed to mix like peanut butter and jelly and it just, this peanut butter and jelly gun explodes and all the peanut butter and jelly is over everyone. It's all over their faces. And then the Robinsons all of a sudden go, hooray, you failed. Wouldn't that be great if when you failed, people went, hooray. <laughs> Usually we say that's okay. And what we mean by that is that failing is bad. But the Robinsons believed that failing was good because what they said was, you, you know, because Lewis was very confused. He was like, why are you so happy that I failed? And they said, Lewis, because if you don't fail, then you won't ever learn. And if you fail, then you're one step closer to your solution. And so they had the saying, and, and this is uh, in, in this little picture here, um, that they have this motto that they say, keep moving forward. So even if you fail, keep moving forward. That, that's what he's saying in, like over and over. Do you see that? He's mouthing it. Keep moving forward. Keep moving forward. <laughs> so in this particular quote, he says, you just focused on the bad stuff when all you had to do was let go of the past and keep moving forward. Friends, I wish it were that easy, but what we find is that failure is this experience that makes it really hard for us to move forward. Maybe some of you have been in a place where you failed, or you failed in trying to follow Jesus, and it felt devastating, and we didn't want to move forward. I think today's scripture has a lot to tell us about failure, because we're going to see Peter, our good friend Peter, we're going to see him spectacularly fail, and we're going to see how Jesus responds to that. So let's uh, dive right into our passage. 
And so starting in verse 22, we find that Jesus made the disciples get into the boat immediately and go on ahead of him to, to the other side while he dismissed the crowd. Do you know where this crowd is from? This is when Jesus went to feed the 5,000. And Jesus actually didn't go to feed the 5,000. Jesus was actually trying to be alone. Because what had happened was uh, his cousin, John the Baptist, had just been killed. And he just found out about this. So he took the disciples and they went to a solitary place where Jesus could be alone with the Father and pray. But all the crowds of people saw Jesus get in the boat and they followed him to the solitary place. And so, of course, they wanted Jesus to, you know, to teach them and to heal them. And Jesus did that. He didn't turn them away. Jesus did that for so long that they got really hungry. And after a while, of course, he told the disciples to feed them. And we had that incredible miracle of feeding the 5,000. But after that happened, Jesus didn't lose his need to be alone with the Father. So he goes off by himself. He tells the disciples, hey, you stay here. I'm going to go on. And I'm going to go alone to be with God to pray. And so later that night, he was there alone. And the boat was already a considerable distance from land, buffeted by the waves, because the wind was against it. And shortly before dawn, Jesus went out to them, walking on the lake. When the disciples saw him walking on the lake, they were terrified. And so the disciples, they see Jesus um, on the lake, and they think he's a ghost, right? And so they are terribly afraid. And this is one of the great uh, uh, sort of themes of this passage, is Jesus says to them, take courage, it is I, don't be afraid. And then something really weird happens. After Jesus says this, Peter says, if it's you, Jesus, then call to me, and I will come out and walk on the water to be there with you. And, and this kind of seems strange to us, but it wouldn't have been strange to Jesus. It wouldn't actually have been strange to the disciples. Because what the disciples understood is that to be a disciple means that you do what your master does. So what Peter saw was Jesus was walking on the water. And he thought to himself, okay, well, Jesus is my master, my teacher. And so I'm going to walk on the water like Jesus. Because that's what a disciple does. They follow their master and they learn to be like them. And so he knew that he needed Jesus to help him with this. So Jesus, if you call to me, then I will go out and walk on the water. And so Jesus does it. He says, yes, come out to me. So Peter steps out of the boat and he starts walking on water. And he actually does it. But what happens is that Jesus... Uh, uh, Peter, he saw the wind, and he was afraid, and he began to sink. And he cried out, Lord, save me. Friends, uh, this next part, verse 31, is crucial. This is, to me, the most important part of the passage. And what's important about this is how do you read verse 31? How do you hear Jesus' voice when you read this? So this is what it says, and I'm going to try to say it without any effect, okay? It just says, immediately Jesus reached out his hand and caught him. You of little faith, he said, why did you doubt? Okay, so I didn't read that with any sort of effect. No drama, right? Just plain. You of little faith, why did you doubt? How do you hear this, friends? I got to tell you, the way that I heard this when I was young, growing up, I, I always heard it like this. You of little faith. You know, maybe Jesus like makes a threatening gesture. <laughs> yeah. You of little faith. Why did you doubt? Is that how you hear it? Is that how you hear it? Because it's not necessarily that. It could be you of little faith. Why did you doubt? But if we hear it that first way, that Jesus is yelling, then I think it really has a great effect on how we see Jesus in our willingness to learn. Because the, the problem is, friends, that fear does not lead to a great environment for us to learn. We know this. If you are afraid... And, and the fear that could come from something like this, if Jesus, your master, your teacher, the son of God, is yelling at you, yelling at you and saying, you screwed up. What's wrong with you? Why did you doubt? I hate that. I hate you. 
Friends, is that going to lead to you wanting to, I know, right? <gasps> oh my gosh. But let me assure you, that's not what Jesus is saying. Right? Remember, what does Jesus say when the disciples first see him? And they're afraid. What does he say? Don't be afraid. It is I. It's the first thing he says. This sets the tone for the whole passage. Don't be afraid. Because Jesus knows for his disciples to learn to be like him. If they're afraid, it's not going to work. Friends, uh, one of the things that I've learned um, when I was a youth pastor, one of the most common things that I would hear from youth, sometimes they would tell me about mistakes that they've made. You know, maybe they did something bad, or they failed some test, or they um, did something at school and they got in trouble, or something happened, right? And sometimes they would confide in me. And the, the most common thing that I would hear from youth all the time, and, and you know, this is coming from Korean American churches, they would always say, right after they share with me some sensitive thing, they would say this, Pastor Steve, don't tell my parents. <laughs> you have to promise, don't tell my parents. Please, don't tell my parents. Please, 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 don't tell my parents. <laughs> There's that fear. There's great fear. And friends, this is what fear does, especially the fear of failure. Fear of failure is very powerful. And I found that, um, you know, fear of failure keeps you from being able to learn. Um, when I was in uh, Korea, I spent a year there uh, in my fourth year of college. Um, I studied abroad at Yonsei University. And during that time, I volunteered at this um, uh, sort of community center. And I taught English classes for free um, to uh, some high school students. And so I did that in Korea. And I also spent three weeks in China on a mission trip. And I did the same thing. I taught English uh, to uh, these Chinese high school students. And I used the exact same curriculum, um, taught the same material. And, um, you know, what I would often do is I would teach them a phrase in English, and I would explain to them what it meant. Um, and then I would ask them, can you use this in a sentence, right? And so what I found was uh, the Korean students, they were very bright. They were great students. And, you know, they, had, um, they were really good at writing and reading English, but they weren't good at speaking English. And what I found is whenever I asked them to speak uh, that phrase in a sentence, nobody wanted to do it. <laughs> no. Some technique, no, no, no. no. They didn't want to do it. No one wanted to do it. They were afraid, right? And so because they were afraid, they never got better. And so their English was very poor. Speaking English was very, very poor. When I was in China, I did the same thing, exact same thing. I taught them a phrase in English, and I explained to them what it meant. I said, hey, who would like to use this English phrase in a sentence? Every single kid shot up their hand. Every single kid wanted to do it. And let me tell you, these kids were not any smarter than the kids in Korea. And they would try, and many of them would fail. They'd get it wrong. They would say something embarrassing. And other people in the class would laugh. But they would still, they would keep doing it. And they kept doing it again and again and again. And so their spoken English was so much better. Friends, why is fear so paralyzing? We know why it, it is, uh, why it can be a bad thing. Because if we never try, then we will never improve. But one of the things that really brings out the fear in us is the fear of rejection. I saw that uh, Reverend Cho had a quote from Henry Nouwen. Um, my, my Korean is very poor, but I could read the Korean that said, Henry Nouwen, right? I was like, oh, hey, Henry Nouwen. I have a quote from Henry Nouwen, too. This is one of his quotes. He says, over the years, I have come to realize that the greatest trap in our life is not success, popularity, or power but self-rejection. This is the greatest trap. This is the greatest problem, is self-rejection. Success, popularity, and power can indeed present a great temptation, but their seductive quality often comes from the way that they are part of the much larger temptation to self-rejection. When we have come to believe in the voices that call us worthless and unlovable, then success, popularity, and power are easily perceived as attractive solutions. The real trap, however, is self-rejection. As soon as someone accuses me or criticizes me, yeah, you have little faith. Why did you doubt? As soon as we hear that, as soon as I am rejected, left alone, or abandoned, I find myself thinking, well, that proves once again that I am a nobody. 
And I say to myself, I am no good. I deserve to be pushed aside, forgotten, rejected, and abandoned. Self-rejection is the greatest enemy of the spiritual life because it contradicts the sacred voice that calls us the beloved. Being the beloved constitutes the core truth of our existence, that we are loved by God. Friends, let me ask you, why is it self-rejection, which Henry Nouwen calls the greatest trap in your life? Why is it not just rejection? I think this is an important distinction because some of us get rejected, you know, actually get rejected. People say, hey, no thanks. You know what? You're not going to get into this school. You know what? You did fail this test. And maybe you get rejected by other people, but you may not reject yourself. You may not take that rejection into your heart and think, oh my gosh, what does that mean about me? You could fail and be rejected by others, but not reject yourself. You could fail and not be a failure. But this is the problem for many of us when we sort of hear Jesus yelling or we hear our parents yelling at us and we think that they are saying to us that we are worthless, that we're a mistake, that you're a failure, and we feel like a failure, then it makes you want to hide. It makes you not want to try. That's why those Korean kids didn't want to raise their hand, right, and try to learn English, right, and try to use this word, the, the words that I taught them in a phrase, because uh, to them, the possibility that they could fail just made them not even want to get out of the boat. And this is to Peter's credit. All of the other disciples didn't get out of the boat, but Peter did. So friends, let me ask you again, how do you hear this phrase when Jesus says, he reaches out his hand? Again, friends, it's very important. Remember, these, this is what we saw from Jesus before. He said, do not be afraid. And first he reaches out his hands. If Jesus was really that mad at Peter, I think he would let Peter sort of sink a little bit more. <laughs> Peter, maybe, you know what, I'll just let you drown. I'll keep the faithful disciples. You're the faithless disciples. So I'm just going to let you sink to the bottom of the lake. And you think about what you did. But he doesn't do that. He reaches out his hand. And friends, in the Greek, you of little faith is one word. This isn't a reproach. This is a, an address. So really what it's saying is little faithless one. Right? So he is somebody who has little faith. So is Jesus being mean here or is Jesus just telling the truth? Jesus looks at Peter and he knows the truth of him. And this is what he says. He's not yelling at him. He's just calling him out as he is. He says, Peter, I know who you are and I know that you have little faith. So if you think about it that way, Jesus knows he has little faith. And he says, so why did you doubt? Why did you doubt? Friends, remember what Jesus tells us. He says that if you have the faith of a mustard seed, you can tell the mountain to go jump into the ocean. If you have little faith, you can tell the mountain to go jump into the ocean. Right? So what is Jesus saying to Peter? You of little faith, I know you have little faith, but why did you doubt? You actually can have faith. You actually can trust in me. You actually can believe. You actually can learn, Peter. Even though I know you have little faith, I'm here with you to help you learn. And that's why Jesus takes him out of the water, brings him back into the boat. And he doesn't dismiss him as a disciple. He doesn't fire him. Peter, you're fired. Get out of here. You don't have enough faith. I need to start over with somebody who's worthy. No. He continues with Peter. He continues teaching him. Friends, what about us? Do you ever fail? Do you ever try to do things, great things for God? You know, maybe you try to forgive someone or you try to love someone. It sort of backfires. It doesn't go so well. You know, maybe you try to tell someone about Jesus and you get your words all mixed up and you say something really just blunt and stupid and that person just kind of rejects you and then you're like, oh my gosh, that was so horrible. I'm never going to try that again. But the thing with Jesus is that he doesn't say that to Peter. He said, hey, you know what? Don't doubt. Trust in me. And what is he saying? He says, you have little faith, but you can trust in me because who am I? I am the Son of God. As soon as Peter comes into the boat and Jesus comes in the boat, what happens? All the wind and the wave just like that stops. It stops. Everything stops. 
And then the disciples, they look at each other and they start worshiping and they say, truly, you are the Son of God. We know that. You are the Son of God. What happened from all of this? What do we take away from a passage like this? When I used to hear this passage, all I focused on was Peter failing. But the end result was the faith of all of the disciples was strengthened by Peter's willingness to get out of the boat and walk. Even though he failed, everyone's faith was strengthened because he was willing to go with Jesus. He was willing to give it a try. I want to end with this, friends. This is a famous picture. Maybe you've seen this. This is a picture of Jesus. It's a little dark, but you see Jesus reaching out his hand to save Peter. When, when I uh, found this picture on the internet, right, you have to save the file. I right-clicked on the picture. And the name of the picture, as somebody titled it, was Peter Sinking in the Water. Right? That was the title. Right? Now, friends, when, when I was saving that file, I was like, you know what? I'm not going to call it Peter Sinking in the Water. I'm going to call it Jesus Saves Peter. What is the emphasis? Is our emphasis that Peter is sinking? Or is the thing that we emphasize, the thing that we focus upon, is Jesus saving Peter? This is the whole question of faith. Is, it, is the most important thing about this passage that Peter has little faith? Or is the most important thing about this passage... That Jesus is faithful. Where you have little faith, Jesus is faithful. He will never stop saving you, friends. He will never reject you. He will never say to you that you are not worthy. Even if you try and you fail, Jesus will never give up on you. I told you just from the beginning of this message, I hate failing. And there are many times where even in spiritual disciplines, trying to pray. I remember there was a time that um, Moksa named Reverend Cho challenged me to pray for one hour every day. So I tried it. First time I tried it, I fell asleep. Second time I tried it, I fell asleep. Third time I tried it, I fell asleep. And the third time I fell asleep, I, I thought to myself, I felt so bad. I felt like such a failure. And I thought, you know what? I'm not going to do this anymore. So I stopped for about a year. And then what I realized, friends, is that, you know, I don't think Jesus looked at me in that moment and said, you have little faith. What's wrong with you? I think what Jesus said is, hey, you know what? You needed a nap. <laughs> you were tired. But keep trying. I'm not going to give up on you. Every time you sink, every time you fail, I'm going to reach out my hand and I'm going to pick you up. So about a year, I decided to try again. But instead of praying an hour a day, I did 30 minutes. <laughs> that was more my speed. And friends, we learn from our experiences. And this is what it means to be a disciple. But we must understand that our teacher in the road of discipleship is a gracious teacher. He will not reject you, even if you fail. You do not have to look at yourself and say, I am a failure. But you can look at the one who will never fail you and say, he is faithful. Amen? Amen.